Hello everyone, Dr. Sunil Dand, internal medicine physician. Welcome to another video. In this video, I would like to talk about a person who really helped me through the darkest days of the pandemic. When I was faced with the threat of losing my career, even having to move country because of a personal healthcare decision, because of me exercising my right to healthcare autonomy. But aside from that, there were so many other really bad things that happened during the pandemic to society in general, and we're still seeing the knock-on effects of that today. The person I'm talking about is Marcus Aurelius, the great Roman emperor, and one of the most important Stoic philosophers of all time. Now, I've talked about Stoicism a fair number of times on this channel, and many of you may remember that back when the pandemic was going on, my channel was actually called MedStoic Lifestyle Medicine because I really got into Stoicism and found it very, very helpful. And there's a lot of confusion behind what Stoicism and what being a Stoic actually means. It's not a religion, it's more a way of thinking and a philosophy that anybody can adopt in life to help them get through especially tough times, but also even the good times. I find it a great set of rules and principles to live by. His most famous work is behind me here on my right, the book Meditations. It's not the easiest book to read, but it does give you an excellent insight into Marcus Aurelius's original thoughts and actions. Remember, this was a man, an emperor, who was all-powerful, and he still managed to practice extreme virtue in his life. A very rare person indeed. We're unlikely to see anybody like him ever again. So much wisdom and so many timeless quotes, which are as relevant today as they were back then. Remember, this is a Greco-Roman philosophy, thousands of years old. One of my favorite quotes from Marcus Aurelius is, The object in life is not to find yourself on the side of the majority, but to escape finding yourself in the ranks of the insane. What a great quote. I'm sure many people who watch this channel can relate to that quote, especially with what's happened over the last few years. And a lot of people at regular intervals, because they hear me talking about Marcus Aurelius and Stoicism, they ask me to tell them more about Marcus Aurelius and Stoicism. And rather than me do that, I'm going to share with you probably one of the best overviews of Marcus Aurelius Stoicism and his book Meditations that you could ever hear. This is Professor Michael Sugru. This talk is a few years old, but it is fantastic. And if anybody wants to know more about this and is curious, please listen for the next few minutes. This is absolutely wonderful, and you will learn more about the man Marcus Aurelius. We are unlikely to see anybody like him ever again. The most interesting of the Stoics is Marcus Aurelius. Lord Acton, the great English philosopher and historian, once said that power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And that's generally speaking true. The difficulty with that generalization is Marcus Aurelius. Marcus Aurelius was an absolute ruler. He was a ruler of the Roman Empire. He was an emperor. He had absolute power of life and death over everyone in the known world. I don't mean everyone in the world as we know it today, but everyone in the world as, as the Romans would have known it. They don't know about China or have a very attenuated conception of the Eskimos. For them, the world is the Mediterranean basin, and Rome owns it. And Marcus Aurelius owns Rome, essentially. His word is law. Now, for almost all the Roman emperors, they lived scandalous lives, and they disgraced themselves. They were much more concerned with indulging their sensual appetites, satisfying their passions, flying into rages. Marcus Aurelius is the standing exception to that, and the exception to Lord Acton's generalization. In his case, power didn't corrupt. Absolute power did not corrupt absolutely. Instead, absolute power allowed us to see what the man underneath the body is really like. It allowed us to find out what Marcus Aurelius' soul is like. Imagine a man for whom all the restraints of law and custom and political order are taken away. He can have whatever he wants. If a man under those circumstances behaves well, you know something about the soul underneath because no external constraint is making him do what he, what he is doing. And Marcus Aurelius is the one example of an absolute ruler who behaves himself in such a way as not to disgrace himself. It's an amazing temptation. Imagine what it's like. Stop and put yourself in that place for a second. Marcus Aurelius takes the throne in 161 AD and he dies in 180 AD. 19 years 
controlling the entire world. He can have all the money in the world. That's not an exaggeration. All the money in the world. If he wants it, he can just collect it all. He can have sex with anyone he wants, whenever he wants, under any circumstances. If he wants to get drunk, he can have wine brought in by the boatload, infinitely, forever. He can go on a drunk now and stay drunk for the next 19 years until he dies. Imagine anything that the bronze, desiring, emotional, irrational parts of your souls want. And now imagine that you can have it. Now, under those circumstances, imagine that you are forced to bear with this human condition for 19 long years. Now, ask yourself, and you didn't give a show of hands, but stop and think about it for a minute. How many of you would fail to disgrace yourselves? To tell you the truth, I don't think that I could meet the challenge. If, you, if you're honest about it, and you stop and think about what kind of a man it takes to, to bear up under those circumstances, I think you'll have to admit, or at least I'll have to admit, that he's a better man than I am. And that in this respect, over the centuries, Marcus Aurelius serves as a standing repro reproach to our self-indulgence, a standing reproach to the idea that we are unable to deal with the circumstances of human life. If you can deal with temptation at that level, I cannot imagine what is outside the human potential. And for the Stoics, we must remember that any virtue which is accessible to any human being is in principle accessible to all of us. We all have a rational nature which allows us to control our feelings, control our behavior, control our connection to other people. Compared to Marcus Aurelius, we have tiny little temptations. We're tempted to steal a little thing. We're tempted to cheat on our income taxes. We're tempted to cheat on our spouses. Marcus Aurelius has that sort of temptation magnified a thousandfold. And he consistently does good stuff. Stop and think about this for a minute. This is no common man. This is not like the rest of us. And I don't know how he did it. Maybe he did it through philosophy, but well, it remains to be seen. Marcus is the last of the good emperors. He's the last of the Antonine emperors. And the emperors that come before him are, generally speaking, okay. They're not as bad as the ones that come after. But Marcus is perhaps the greatest of the Romans, the noblest of the Romans. When old-fashioned writers talk about Roman virtue, what they have in mind is Marcus Aurelius, a man who does what he ought to do regardless of circumstance. Tough Roman virtue. He's not afraid of being dead. He's not afraid of being in pain. He's not afraid of having people laugh at him. He's only afraid of doing what's wrong. He's only afraid of making chaos of his soul. Why? Because his soul is the only thing he's completely in control of. It's the only thing he's responsible for. And the rest of it is a matter of indifference to him. He'll certainly try and perform his function as emperor in the best way he possibly can. But there are Germans at the border, and should they succeed in winning this war, he did the best he could. He has no reason to feel guilty. He has no reason to feel that this is a difficulty. If for some reason he gets sick, well, sickness is part of human life. You accept it as it is, you deal with it the best you can, and then you move on. In other words, Marcus Aurelius intends to live a life in which he will not have to feel guilty about anything. And he succeeded in doing that under the most trying possible circumstances. Again, put yourself in a position where you can have anything you want, and no one can stop you. No matter how evil, no matter how depraved, no one can stop you because your word is law. Marcus Aurelius behaved himself for 19 years under those circumstances. It's a standing reproach to our self-indulgence. The kind of things that Marcus Aurelius writes are not meant for publication. Let's think about this a little further. Marcus wrote this manuscript without intending to have it published. After his death, he wanted to have it burned. Some philosophically inclined, I guess, bookkeeper, librarian, aide de camp or whoever it is that picked this up, said, no, we, ju we just can't throw this out. We cannot lose the memory of such a great man, and we can't lose the sort of meditations that he created. He wrote a book called The Meditations, and it's a book to himself that's not intended to be published. What sort of a man writes a book to himself? Well, what sense does that make? Think about it. The nature of a book is communicating something, and we would think we would communicate it to some reader. But this is not going to be published. It's written to himself. What makes a man write a book to himself? And there's a very deep answer, I think, here. Marcus Aurelius writes a book to himself because he's the loneliest man in the world. He has no friends because he has no equals. Think about a man 
breaking himself on the rock of an impossible virtue. He has no equals. Everyone he talks to wants something from him. He is the emperor of everything in the world. He owns it all. Everything he says immediately gets done. He has absolute life and death power over everyone. So anytime he's in the throne room, he's having an audience. Someone comes in from some part of the empire. They're always here for some reason, and they're always here because they want something from him. And all Marcus wants to do is live a philosophical life. But he happens to have had the misfortune to be born the emperor of Rome. What a pity. So he has to deal with these self-centered, swinish people all the time, and it is his responsibility to do good for them, to give them justice, to give them both examples of virtue and virtuous laws and virtuous decisions. And the weariness of it gets to him after a while. The book that he's written, The Meditations, is shot through with a kind of philosophical melancholy that is extremely moving despite the stoic content of what he's saying. In other words, oddly enough, there are very few books in the world which generate more pathos, which create more of a sense of pity for a person reading this than this book. He's writing a book to himself because he has no one else to talk to. And what kind of things does he write in the book? Moral maxims. I mean, he has two or three ideas. It's about a hundred odd pages, but he says essentially the same thing again and again and again. Why? He has nobody to talk to, so that limits the scope of his conversations. And he's constantly trying to re remind himself that, look, although the people you're dealing with are corrupt, evil, and depraved, it's your job not to get angry with them, but to try and teach them and morally improve them. If you can't morally improve them, at least put up with them because the gods have created us social animals. And it is part of the mark, or it is the mark of a philosophical man that he should return benefits for harm because those that would harm other people do not live the philosophical life. Those that don't want the ultimate good for themselves and for society do so because they don't know any better. Marcus has not only political power, but wisdom, and in that respect, He's the only example in the Western tradition of any ruler who even remotely approximates Plato's philosopher king. And he has some of the qualities that Plato thought the philosopher king would have. He is totally disdainful of wealth. Why? He owns everything. What would it be like to own everything from England to Egypt? Well, the idea of accumulating more stuff becomes less and less interesting if you stop and think about it. And if you can have sex with, say, a million people, the million at first has very limited attraction. And at that point, he stops to think, and he says, I will do my best to constantly do what I ought to do. And there is a sort of whistling in the graveyard tone to this book. He is, in some respects, an enormously lonely man, and in some respects, an enormously sad man. There's a melancholy in this that's terrifically moving. And yet, we ought not to pity Marcus Aurelius, because if he looked at our lives, he would pity us pathetic creatures that we are. We don't even meet his standard of virtue, and we're pitying him. Think about the irony of that. He said, well, I'd pity you back if I didn't think that was disrespectful. Think about what it takes to be something like Marcus Aurelius. We shall not see his like again. In the book itself, he has all kinds of intriguing and caustic, if you will, moral maxims. He says things like this, soon you will have forgotten all things and soon all things will have forgotten you. In other words, don't get overwrought. You're angry with this guy just because he didn't do what he was supposed to do? Ask yourself how many of the people that are working for you are doing what they're supposed to do. Soon, you'll have forgotten all this, because you'll be dead. And soon, all the people who know you, they're going to be dead too, and they'll have forgotten you. And so what's the point of being mean to people? Now imagine the kind of philosophical self-restraint we're talking about here. This is a guy who can chop everyone's head off if he gets sufficiently angry, so he never does. Remarkable, remarkable. So Marcus Aurelius is a man who constantly, in his book, is writing short one and two line epigrams that essentially say things like, don't lose your temper with these people, Marcus, you know how they are. <laughs> Marcus, it's not your fault that they're stupid. You tried to teach them and you can keep on trying to teach them, but if Socrates was a good man and they killed him, what do you expect them to do to you? On the other hand, Marcus Aurelius is willing to rule the Roman Empire for the same reason that the Platonic philosopher King is. If he gives up, somebody worse is going to take the job, and you know what happens then, right? He'd much rather just go home and read his books. He doesn't want to listen to this stuff. But he says, well, the gods put me here. I didn't ask for this job, but I can't very well give it up. I'd be abdicating my responsibility to other people. Imagine the bad laws and bad emperors were going to get after me. Well, should I give the job up now or stand here until the gods are good enough to relieve me of my post?
In fact, that's the metaphor he uses all the time. The gods have put you on guard over the Roman Empire. Everyone else is sleeping. Stay where you are and stay awake, elsewise God knows what's going to happen. Marcus Aurelius is constantly whistling his way through the graveyard, trying to tell him that this is a very happy life, that he loves being a philosopher, and he particularly loves the particular portion of reality the gods have assigned to him. Now, I think that everyone believes this except the people that read this book, which perhaps is why it wasn't supposed to be published, because when you look at this, you see a terrifically lonely man, a man of immense moral heroism, who has no shoulder to cry on, who disdains crying because what's the point of crying? We must live in accordance with nature. Now here's the natural condition of human beings. They get born, all kinds of stuff happens to them, and they die. Marcus's maxims with reference to that are A, stop complaining. There's nothing to complain about because there's only two kinds of things. There are the kinds of things you can control and there are the kinds of things you can't. If you can't control it, complaining about it is stupid and a waste of time and I don't want to hear any more about it because you can't control it, so what's the point of talking about this? Or you have the other kind of thing, the kind of thing you can control, like your intentions, like your behavior, like your actions. And since you can control them, who do you expect to help you out except yourself? Stop complaining about that too. So whether it's the kind of thing you can control or it's the kind of thing you can control, Marcus Aurelius does not want to hear any complaints and he does not want to hear any excuses because there are no excuses to give. Whew. Now, that's easy enough to say. And a lot of people think that other people should be this way. <laughs> right? Have you noticed it? Like, you can't help but admire this guy. Like, every, every one of us I bet in this audience said, wow, what a great guy. I wish I knew him personally. No, you don't. Think of what he think of you. <laughs> you really don't want to know this guy. Imagine working for him. Oh, please. No, this guy is never going to be satisfied. And if he is satisfied, he's not like he's going to give you applause. He's going to say, well, you're doing what you ought to do. No compliments for you. You're doing what you ought to do. You don't need any reward beyond that. You're living like a philosophical man, which is a reward in itself. Virtue is its own reward. You're virtuous. What do you want from me? Get back to work. And of course, if you're not virtuous, you are pretty much what he expects human beings to be, you swine. <laughs> and what's unnerving about this is that there's not the slightest taint of hypocrisy in it. He not only says this stuff. He acts this stuff. He not only talks the talk, he walks the walk. He does it. And he does it under worse, more difficult circumstances than you. Fail to do it. And yet he still likes us. In other words, he still go out of his way to help us out. If he were the judge in a court of law, he would still give us justice, even though we have done nothing to deserve it. As a matter of fact, we, what is it that, uh, that, that, what's the line from Hamlet? If we gave every man his desserts, who would escape a whipping? Marcus Aurelius would. That's part of the problem with Marcus Aurelius. There's nothing quite like this guy in the whole history of the world. <laughs>